Good morning. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of some of the key points of the work that we do within NICE and set that in a global context. And I'll try and ignore the music. NICE was set up in 1999 as an independent organization and as David Nicholson helpfully said earlier, to drive the uptake of new technologies. That was very clear in our original remit. And we were asked to do that by setting national guidance based on a review of the best available evidence and critically doing an economic analysis to work out what was best value for money. And this isn't something that applies to the UK with financial constraints that we may have in our health system. We're aware from a whole range of international contacts that we've established that it's an international challenge to be able to adopt new technologies at the same time as managing your health system within a defined budget. I've shown a screenshot from the NICE website on the right of the slide specifically to mention that we've always made a point of being open and transparent in the work that we do. And having a lot of information on the NICE website has, I'm, is, I'm sure, one of the main things that's raised the international profile of NICE. And more than half of the website usage comes from abroad. NICE has a program that covers health, public health, and shortly, social care. I'm just going to focus for a moment on some of the key things we do within the health service. We're probably most well known for drug, te drug technology appraisals. And again, the point here is not to ration access to new drugs, but to drive the uptake of those that are shown to be most cost effective. Patients have a right to drugs we've approved under the NHS constitution, but we know that the impact of technology appraisals applies not just in the UK, but also internationally. We also have a program of looking at new interventional procedures. These are things that are largely surgical techniques or things that radiologists use. We look specifically at safety and efficacy. And often there isn't much information for these new procedures. We don't want to stifle in innovation at this point and we actively work with researchers to ensure that the data does become available for us to make future recommendations. A couple of new programs, we now look at medical technologies specifically to identify where there will be cost savings for the health service. So there might need to be some upfront investment, but we're looking to really support those where we know there will be longer term or even medium term cost savings for the health service. And a new program on diagnostic tests. You'll all be aware there's an big increase in the number of diagnostic tests being produced, often linked with treatments, um, particularly genetic testing and cancer, you might like to think. So this is going to be a new important area of work for NICE in the future. And just to wind up with clinical guidelines, because clinical guidelines are very important in bringing together the whole context of healthcare. They've set the scene across a whole disease or condition to summarize what best practice is. And NICE, as far as I'm aware, has the largest clinical guidelines program in the world. We've issued well over 100 clinical guidelines and there are many more in development. We produce these very much in conjunction with clinicians and other healthcare workers who give us their time on a voluntary basis. The core principles of developing NICE guidance, though, are the same, whether it's a clinical guideline or a technology appraisal. <clears throat> we always look at a comprehensive evidence base. We involve experts, clinicians, economists, etc. Importantly, patients and carers. And we have independent advisory committees. That's key, because to get this guidance used, to get new technologies adopted, we must have a credible and robust process. And using independent committees is an important part of that. <clears throat> we have a consultation with stakeholders. And it says genuine consultation, because sometimes we change our mind. Sometimes that's described as a U-turn. But actually, we need to listen to what feedback we have. <clears throat> it's a... Uh, some, it's a process where we have a regular review and it's all transparent. 
The point at the beginning about evidence is absolutely key, and we were aware early on that sometimes we were presented with a new drug to appraise where we didn't have the optimum evidence. So we began working with the pharmaceutical industry to run um, advice seminars so that the industry understood the evidence base that we required. Those have been very successful, and from September this year, we'll be running similar seminars with the medical technology and diagnostics industries too, to make sure we're all working towards getting the right evidence available. As I said earlier, at an international level, everyone is facing the same challenges in funding their health service at the same time as adopting new technologies. And we've had widespread interest in the work that we do within NICE from the international community. So as a consequence, in 2008, NICE set up a small unit within the organization called NICE International to give us some capacity to respond to those requests at an international level. <clears throat> it's um, provided a whole range of, of, of support, including advice on using evidence, technical support around health technology assessment, and also advice on what people might do in practice to put similar processes in place. We have a small team, but we do work very closely with our external contributors, academics and clinicians, etc., to provide the capacity that's required at an international level. This slide shows some of the countries where we've provided advice and support. <clears throat> it's generally low and middle income countries where we've provided most input. And just a few examples before I close. <clears throat> we have done some work in Turkey where we were involved in assessing a performance-based payment scheme in family medicine. <coughs> this was funded by the World Bank and draws on experience that NICE has of setting the quality and outcomes framework indicators for the primary care system in the UK. <clears throat> we did some work in Romania to help them work through what a basic care package might be. We have some ongoing work in Colombia with the Ministry of Social Protection to help them establish a Colombian version of NICE. <clears throat> And this work, as I say, is still ongoing. We're giving advice on how they might set up an appeals program. We've co-hosted uh, an international conference with the BMJ group in the UK on global health <clears throat> and have provided a whole range of study visits across the globe. And the final point in the bottom right-hand corner about adapting NICE guidelines is an area of work that we are frequently approached to provide support with. I said earlier we have a very large guideline program and lots of countries will want to use those guidelines that we've developed. And what we do is to um, help those countries work out where they might need to adapt them for their local circumstances. So finally then, in summary, NICE has a well-respected international program of using evidence to define best practice guidance. This is all carried out through independent advisory committees. And support, to support that, we've set up a small unit within NICE called NICE International. And if I can just draw your attention at the end to a quote from Professor Alexandra in Georgia who very much highlights the successful collaboration being a good example of how productive the joint efforts of enthusiastic and dedicated people may be in a very short time period. Thank you very much.